Hi, it's Dave. Welcome. Today I'm joined by uh, James Dama. Today is episode three of a multi-part series that we're doing, kind of unpacking Andre Kalpathy, Tesla's head of AI's recent presentation on the progress of full self-driving. Episode one is kind of the context of, you know, why Tesla's doing what they're doing. Episode two, we did a kind of a um, uh, side kind of thoughts or episode on um, the advantages of safety, active and passive that Tesla has. And then third, this episode is going to be focusing on the data collection. So what did Tesla do uh, to collect the data they needed to really solve this depth depth problem of objects to remove radar to improve, you know, this full self-driving? Uh, so we'll focus on data collection and kind of how they brought all that into, um, yeah, their training models, but we'll, um, and then the future episodes, we're going to talk about um, auto labeling and also the training on the supercomputer. So anyways, I want to welcome James back um, for episode number three. All right. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, for those who don't know, don't know obviously this is uh, recorded all in one day on a, in a marathon session here, but I'm going to release it probably mm -hmm. one per day over the next week or so. But um, yeah, um, um, I wanted to start off the discussion by kind of giving people context because I think people hear like, oh, data is so important, especially with artificial intelligence and neural nets. But um, I think for most people, it's just like something they've heard, but they don't really realize how important data is. Um, <clears throat> one example is, so I, I still run a company um, that, a software company that we do mobile apps. We've been doing it for almost 12 years. 13 years so far, but I have one of my developers taking some AI courses called fast.ai. And I'm wanting to experiment, like, what can we do with neural nets? You know, what kind of products we can make? And so he's going through this course, he's reporting to me, and, I'm, and we're brainstorming ideas and stuff. But I'm having such a hard time because the data is like, it's all about the data, it feels like. If you don't have really like useful data that's going to produce some really interesting, you know, stuff. You don't really have much anything like with neural nets. It seems like, you know, um, and it, it really just reinforced the idea of like how important collecting valuable data, like unique, rare data at large amounts, right? Mm -hmm. But not just that, but it has to be the product, the end product has to be useful to the consumer as well, right? And all of these things have, have to come together and when we're talking about Tesla just right now kind of collecting data, it's like, I'm like, oh man, this is like, they've hit a gold mine. Like, you know, all this driving data with edge cases, they're so valuable because it all trains, you know, the system to get better. And it's like, this is life and death, right? It's like every, you know, piece of that data, every edge case is adding to make the system better. Um, and it's one of those things where I'm like, wow, man, this is like, it's, it's huge, right? And it seems like, you know, some people say data is everywhere, you know, what's the big deal about data? But the reality is like valuable data in large amounts that end up in a real like useful product is extremely rare. I, what's what's kind of your kind of experience with data? In, in the case of self-driving cars, you have a lot of edge cases that you want to get into also. And one another characteristic of, of neural networks is that they're not inductive. They don't extrapolate, they interpolate. That is, if they've seen this and they've seen this and you show them something in between, they're pretty good at drawing a line between those two and sort of understanding this new thing's relationship, right? But if I give it this and I give it this and now I show it this, like it's outside the envelope of everything that it's saying. It's much harder for a neural network to do a good job with that kind of stuff. So what we wanna do when we collect data is we want lots of data points and we want the biggest possible cloud so that as to the greatest extent possible, everything the neural network encounters is somewhere within the sphere of things that were in its training set. So it can interpolate, it doesn't have to extrapolate. So. If you got a complicated system, you want to gather a lot of data because you want to make that that cloud as as big as you can. But it's not it's not just size that matters. Because this I'm drawing this cloud. If I have two data points and they're real similar, they're right next to each other. They don't make my cloud a lot bigger, right? I want a lot of variety because variety is what pushes the envelope of the cloud of everything I know out. So I think mean, uh, Carpathian in his talk he talked about you know. LCD, like a large data set, a clean data set, and a diverse data set. These are all important. Size is important because without size, you can't get a big cloud. Clean is important. Clean is, you know, 
for instance, if I've got labeled data, it has the right labels on it. Like every wrong labeled piece of data that goes into your s s training set creates a lot of confusion. So it's one thing to gather a lot of data and get it labeled. And it's another thing to gather a lot of data and have really good labels. Like it's the label is the label that you need it to have, and it's the right label. When you have millions and millions of these things, you know, if you go out and you gather your data with a steam shovel or whatnot, a certain <clears throat> amount of stuff you don't want it gets in there, erroneous data. And so uh, Carpathy, in his career, he has repeatedly emphasized how important it is to get your data really clean. You know, have a process that's very reliable about making reliable data or have the people who label your data make sure they're really well trained and you have a really good process that double and triple checks everything. So that's what he means by clean. And diverse is, this is, the, diverse is kind of like the secret superpower that the, uh, that the Tesla fleet has. This is the diversity is the thing that they can get from the Tesla fleet, not just volume. Diversity is, you know, if I have a whole lot of data points and they're right next to each other, I'm not really learning a lot. I want as many different cases as I can to push that envelope of space in which I can interpolate, you know, what I'm seeing to be as big as possible. And that's diversity. You want diversity on lots of different dimensions. So, uh, you know, if you there's only so much video of following a car down a highway that's useful. Right? I think Carpathy had the thing. Yeah, I think he said at one point, you know, at some point the neural network just gets it. You don't need any more examples of that. And so if you're going to train your neural network and you're going to have more data to make it better, pick something else, something that's relevant, something that's important, but something that you haven't seen before. Right. So that's where we get more, you know, more and more examples of stuff in the world. And once you've got a decent sized set, all the new stuff you're collecting is edge cases, right? They're out on the edge of the cloud and you're pushing the boundary of that, of that cloud of stuff that you can learn from bigger and bigger. So all those are super important. And the, uh, something that's, that is not widely or well enough appreciated about Tesla's fleet is Tesla's fleet of cars, they're not a million robots with eight cameras that are out there just, mo just hoovering up every single thing they see. They're not just recording whatever they run across and uploading it to Tesla. What Tesla does is they send instructions out to the fleet. I want this. I want tunnels. I want garages. I want roads where the stripes are in the wrong place, or I want places where the signage is wrong or, you know, they, they can, they can specify by telling the car, when you see this set of circumstances, ha capture that data and send it back to me. So the fleet, it, it's not a recording device primarily. What, what it is, is it's a search device, right? You tell it, find these things in the world for me and send them back. And the fleet goes out and it finds those things. It doesn't, you know, specifically go driving to do that kind of stuff. But when it sees something that's relevant to what Tesla needs right now. So what Tesla can do is when they're building this cloud, they can look at the edge of the cloud and say, I want more stuff right here because that's what's going to push the boundary out. And so they tell the fleet, send me this stuff. And then they push the boundary out in that direction. That's how data collection is working. <laughs> And that's the, the magic of the fleet. The, these are not a bunch of dumb cameras rolling around. These are very smart systems that already have really sophisticated neural networks in them. So you can give them quite elaborate criteria for what you're looking for, and they can use that computational power they have to look for very specific things that Tesla wants, find them, and then send just those things back to Tesla. So Tesla doesn't have to waste the labeler's time looking at more examples of stuff they've seen. They don't have to waste the training time, training the network on more stuff that it's already seen. The whole process becomes tremendously more efficient because of how powerfully selective the vehicles in the fleet are. This is a really important characteristic, which people mostly don't talk about because yeah. I think it's it's not an easy idea to get your head around that these aren't just recording devices. They're, they're very sophisticated sensors that are looking for very particular things that Tesla knows that they need because they've looked at where the network is failing and they've decided if I had more examples of this situation, it's not working in, it would get better. And that, yeah. that process has worked really well for them. Yeah. So, I mean, this, this is um, a great stuff because I mean, I want to take that a little further and, and ask um, <clears throat> if you can kind of explain the whole, um, thing that Karpathy was talking about in terms of using triggers to collect the data. So yeah. in my understanding, you could do this kind of 
um, let's say the car is kind of this uh, search surveillance, you know, recording capturing device that you could send instructions to capture anything you want. So you could say, hey, I want to capture, you know, uh, trucks with bicycles on the back of the truck or et cetera. But I mean, that's one way you can give the instruction for certain objects. But then another way is you could uh, run the car in shadow mode. So you run actually a, a, a version of software that isn't widely released. It's a private, let's say version. You run it in shadow mode where it's comparing itself on how perhaps it would drive compared to how the driver is driving. And based upon certain types of triggers or criteria, you can collect the different video clips, the discrepancies um, that you're searching for. And that becomes a kind of data collection approach. Is that kind of um, correct? Yeah. So <clears throat> when when Tesla knows that they, what a particular rule that they create for a particular kind of thing they want, they call that a trigger. And it becomes a trigger when they write the rule down and they formulate it in such a way that they can push it out to the fleet as a rule that will trigger when it sees that thing in the real world. And then it'll capture all that data and send it back. Something that wasn't clear when Carpathia was talked about this is that the triggers that you want vary depending on where you are in the process. So he described that from, you know, initially they they built a network to try to imitate what the radar was doing, to, to try to predict what radar should have been telling them about the world. So in the beginning, you don't know, you you, you know very little about what you want. The one thing that you do have is you have this radar, right? So one thing that you could start out doing is just try to build a network that just does what the radar does, right? So your initial trigger uh, you, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily be triggered. The first thing you might do is go out and gather a bunch of data of like, this is what the radar did in this situation. So you just go out and you, you get a bunch of clips of, of varied situations and you have a recording of what the radar said and you have a recording of what the cameras saw. And you initially you train a neural network that's just like, tell me what the radar would say in this situation, right? So that's your starting point. And the data for that is just a broad cross section of, of situations that the, that the car sees. Okay, so now you've got your first cut at the system, right? And I wanna make it better because it's definitely not gonna be good enough at this point. So how am I gonna make it better? Well, what I wanna do is I want examples of where it didn't work, right? And uh, so one way to gather those examples is I have cars out there in the fleet that are driving around doing something, I'll take this network and I'll put it on those cars in shadow mode, which means it's running, but it's not doing anything in a car. It's just running and making predictions. And now what I can do now that I've got it in the car is I can have another piece of, I can have a trigger that looks at the output of that and looks for situations where it seems like it's not doing very well and record those for me. So for, for, a, for example, like these first couple of triggers on this list, they're kind of that kind of thing, a radar vision mismatch. So when uh, when when the radar isn't telling you something that that something about your vision uh, suggests that it should be doing, like that's potentially a radar failure, and you can capture it or bound, bounding box jitter. So the radar has a localization. It it doesn't just return a signature. It also returns like a kind of x y coordinate for where it's got the signature for where the return signal is coming from. If that's hopping around, that might be a place where radar isn't doing very well, right? And that might be a place. So if your pseudo radar is generating your bounding box output also, and you're seeing it hop around quickly, because things in the real world don't tend to do that, that could be a trigger, right? So bounding box detection or detection flicker, like the radar's telling me there's a car, there's not a car, there's a car, there's not a car. It's seeing things and losing them, like that's an example of where it's not working. So in the beginning, you start with pretty simple things, and these triggers, you push them out to the fleet, you're looking for pretty pretty basic failures in the beginning, and they're intuitive failures, where a human says, well, it just shouldn't do that in that situation, and we're gonna get, capture that data. and and uh, and and uh, so down the road, there might be other kinds of triggers that you have. Like down, uh, they have one down here, which is, um, you know, objects on the roof, right? So they see, you know, they're, they're gathering these failures and they notice that a lot, of, a lot of times it's when somebody has a tent or a canoe on the roof of the car that it's not working very well. So they're yeah. like, oh, we need more examples of where there's some object on the car, which is including maybe part of the visual stream. And they, okay. and they- uh, uh, 
question on this. So, I mean, are we are, are these triggers for detecting when the radar doesn't perform well or when the vision doesn't perform well? So this is pseudo radar we're talking about, right? So sure. uh, now a trigger can be anything. The the uh, Tesla any any condition that the vehicle could can detect right could be a trigger for gathering data. So for instance, they have going in and out of tunnels. At some point, they noticed that the that the pseudo radar that they were building the vision analog to radar that they were trying to get working that it had a spe it had problems when you went into tunnels and when you came out of tunnels. So in that situation, the way you fix that is you just get a lot more examples of going in and out of tunnels and you train on it. And if you have enough examples, it, the, network, the neural network will figure it out and it'll stop having problems in that situation. So some of the triggers are like that. It's just there's this, this situation and we generally know we have problems. We don't know why or maybe we have, a, we have an idea why, but we're not going to try to fix it specifically. We're just going to gather a bunch of examples because the magic of neural networks is you just give them more data and they just get better. So right. you can always fall back on just get more samples and to solve the problem. So, I mean, this is not, um, again, this is, this is for the pseudo, pseudo LIDAR or right. pseudo radar. So the vision part, right. not to try to make the radar, the physical radar better, but to make right. the vision function to make better. the pseudo, they're exactly. training a neural network to mimic exactly. what the radar does. Okay. Right. And so you can imagine that you could have triggers that to some extent, look at what the real radar is doing, right? Like mm -hmm. for, for instance, it, you know, in the beginning, when you're when you're first building the system to compare them, if the radar is telling you something that the pseudo radar isn't telling you, and your initial goal is, well, initially what I want to do is get to where I can do this, just the, what the system is doing. At that point in time, then if it if the radar and the pseudo radar disagree, that could be a trigger, right? So in the beginning, now eventually, ideally, your pseudo radar starts working better than your radar, and you don't want to look so much for where it disagrees. Because now it's disagreeing, not because it's worse, but because it's better. So when you get to that stage of the development process, you have to look for other, you're looking for where what it does doesn't make sense, irrespective of what the regular radar does. Okay. For instance, mm -hmm. the bounding box jitter or the detection jitter, right? If, you know, it, you should consistently, if there's a car in front of you, you should detect it consistently. It shouldn't fade in and out. Mm -hmm. So, um, like examples of the of detection jitter are, um, Carpathy had some examples where he was showing situations where a v the vehicle ahead was temporarily occluded, mm -hmm. like there was a cloud of dust, or it was rainy, or something like that, or there was some mist. And that would be an example of where we've got it, a trigger that you would use when you're when you've got it working and now what you're doing is you're looking for failure modes that are specific to vision. So obviously the regular radar, it doesn't care if there's rain and it doesn't care if there's a cloud of dust in the way, right? It'll still be able to see the car because it's not affected by clouds of dust, but vision is. So you might, you send a trigger out to, uh, to the, to the net, um, to the fleet that basically says, if you see the car and then you don't see it, and then you see it again, you know, that's, that's detection jitter, capture those. And some of those are going to be because there's a cloud of dust or there's some temporary occlusion, which shouldn't matter. Okay. Going back to these triggers here. So, um, Tesla is basically, you know, sending out criteria of the type of video clips they want to get back to be used in training. But I'm curious, are most of these triggers um, about, okay, so you're running the car in shadow mode with this latest software where you're trying to remove, let's say, radar, uh, radar from. Are you trying to get the cases where the vision is having difficulty um, accurately and consistently uh, detecting depth or velocity, like where there's a like flicker or where, whether there's, I guess, it's not accurate and you're trying to, is that kind of the folk, the main focus of these triggers, so trying to get those cases? that's a subset of what the of what the tr the triggers generally are anytime uh, you have a phenomenon where it appears likely that the pseudo radar is not generating the output that you believe it should be generating, right? If, if it doesn't make sense. Uh, and that's why I said like jitter is an example of one of those things that we know that in the real world, there isn't jitter. And there's a, a, there might be a certain amount of jitter, which is unavoidable. But if your jitter is, uh, is larger than a certain threshold, then probably there's some condition that you're in right now 
with that the system just isn't dealing with very well. And so more examples of that situation are likely to reduce that jitter in the future. I mean, so, so jitter is a pretty generic one that yeah, you can use in a lot I mean, of situations. I mean, could we group it into saying like the radar's function is to determine, let's say, depth and velocity and acceleration, and then the weaknesses or failures of that would be lack of consistency and lack of accuracy. So in situations mm -hmm. where, let's say, you know, there wasn't an accurate depth or velocity or whatever acceleration reading or it wasn't consistent. It's like flickering or whatever. Th those are or the cases. Or you couldn't right? match it up, right? This mm -hmm. is another, one of the ways that, that using radar with vision can be tough is radar is super low. Radar, basically, you could think of it as it's got these big blocks. Mm -hmm. And inside each one of those blocks, it's going to return a signal. And the signal it returns is for whatever the brightest reflection in that box is. Uh, and so part, what, part of what the system is doing is it's got these big crude blocks of what the radar can see. And then it's got this, it's got what the, what the vision sees. And it has to match those two up because they're generally, they're positionally, they're, they're not going to align perfectly, right? I mean, the brightest in radar, the brightest part of a car isn't going to be the center of the rear, which is the center of the, what vision sees, right? It's going to be some corner on the bumper in the rear corner of it or something like that. And so the, your, net, your network has to be smart enough to sort of understand that this reflection from the bumper at this point, which is the strong reflection there, that that's this car, even though the, they don't line up perfectly, right? They'll line up kind of broadly, generally. And, and, uh, and one of the ways that that you get failures on radar is when you've got this big block that has this really important thing that you're tracking, usually the lead vehicle in the case of AEB, and you get it, you and tr you have a transitory other very bright object that enters that bright being like a Coke can sitting on the floor. This is the, the bottom of a Coke of a soda can. It's an almost perfect parabolic reflector for radar, right? So like a radar in a car, like it can see a Coke can like five miles down the road. They're wow. so bright, right? So if so if 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 that comes into the block that of some important object you're trying to, to track, the signal return from the Coke can, it temporarily overwhelms your ability to get the signal that you want. So you could get you would just get a dropout, right? Because because the radar doesn't have this dynamic range to be able to track that object with the Coke can in the same sort of field of view. Mm -hmm. Got it. So when you're talking about pseudo, uh, pseudo radar, are you just talking about, um, in its essence, the ability to, to uh, identify more information about the objects that it visually sees um, in regards to you know, depth and velocity and acceleration, or is there more to that? So pseudo radar is a term that I was using to describe kind of the early phase of what, of what, uh, uh, Carpathy was implying that they did in the beginning, right? At the first stage of trying to understand why they were having problems with AEB was, uh, or, you know, whether or not uh, essentially trying to do something with the vision system could be a remedy of the problems that they were having was let's just try to build a neural network that just does what the radar does and see how hard that is and see if it's better. Right. So there's this early stage of that where, uh, you know, you've already got autopilot and you've got all the stuff that's riding in the car, but we're just focused on trying to answer this one question, which is, can we do the job with vision? Right. And so one way that you could do that. And it seems like what, what, uh, what the autopilot engineering team did was they just tried to make a neural network with the camera and make it substitute for the radar and just see how that works. So there was this phase that they went through where they were just trying to do this relatively simple thing. So that's the thing that I'm calling pseudo radar, yeah. right? They were trying to make a radar that didn't have a radar. They were trying to make the vision system do what the radar did without having to have the radar to sort of compare the, what, you know, the difficulty of those, of those two things. Cause then you could basically say, well, how hard is it for me to make the radar better? And how hard is it relatively speaking, how hard is it for me to make my pseudo radar better? Because if it's much easier to make the pseudo radar better, well, you're better off putting your time into making that better. Right. right. So, I mean, so other parts of the effort incidentally were the, le the downstream thing. Like once they had decided that this was a, that this was, uh, um, a good, Thing to put some effort into to see if you could make it better. 
At that point, you don't really want a separate block of code, mm -hmm. right? Pseudo radar, because it's got this, you've got this huge, very sophisticated vision stack that's already in, the, in, in autopilot. So when you start doing your pseudo radar, you know, when you start actually trying to make it work in the car, you, you merge it and you merge those functions into the main autopilot stack and you build a head off of the vision stack, which is giving you your, your faux radar things. Now in the long run, the goal at the end of the day was not, well, let's have a radar. The goal at the end of the day is let's stop the car when it needs to stop, right? So the pseudo radar sort of experiment is just kind of a sidetrack of that. It's a way to ask the question is in an A-B comparison, can we do better than the radar? Because if we can do better at the radar that for the job we're asking the radar to do, then at a minimum, uh, we know that that'll be a profitable way to go. But, but in the long run, uh, what we want the neural net, what we want the vision stack to, to do is tell us accurately that, that to stop when I need to stop. Okay. Right. So, so what they're, what they ultimately deploy to the fleet doesn't have a fake radar signal in it. Mm. Right. Instead, it's doing other things that get you to the end goal of should I hit the brakes or not. Right. And so initially the reason they were doing that with the radar was because it's a radar and this is the kind of signal you get out of a radar and if you're going to use radar you have to deal with that kind of signal but in the long run you don't need that detour of let's do it the way the radar does right in the long run you just need the neural network to tell you stop or or you don't need to stop here okay yeah so i'm wondering if you could go ahead and um kind of break this down a bit like what this means so so let's look at this a second okay. so this is the we talked about the triggers. So the triggers was, it's a set of rules you push out to the fleet to gather some data. And Carpathian is talking, he said that in the process of developing this AEB that does not require radar, you know, which initially it starts out as pseudo radar, but in the end it's not pseudo radar, it's just a better vision network that doesn't need radar, right? That in the process of getting there, what we do is, you know, initially we've got this basic capability. It's weak in certain places. We send out triggers to ask for more examples of places where it's weak. We get the data from those. We go through that data to clean it up, to verify that it's the stuff that we want. Most of that data goes into training, a, an, an update. In other words, we're going to, we're going to iterate and make the next version of this thing, which is improved because we've got new data in specifically the places where it's weak. Now, some of that data, we're going to set aside as unit tests, which is this is a place where we failed before, that which is why we took the data, and we want it to work in this situation. So we're going to set these aside. We're not going to train on them, and we're going to keep working on the system until it, until it works in this situation too. So they've got a large stack of these of these failure modes, you know, cases where the where the system didn't work before, and they're going to keep working on the system until it's nailing all those cases, right? So that's kind of an exit criteria. Like you keep iterating until it all works. So Carpathy said they had to go through this loop seven times. So seven times they pushed a bunch of triggers out to the field for the cases that they thought were bad. They got the things in, they trained a new network, uh, and then they pushed it out again and they looked for failure modes a second time and so on. They went through this seven times and each time it gets a little bit better. And after seven times, it was good enough, right? It was passing enough unit tests and, uh, and passing unit tests in this case, pa work, passing unit tests and working in the field, having a very low failure rate. Well, that's a definition of success for them, right? So, so this slide I have right here, this is the loop. That they're, that they're doing, right? This, that we're, they call this the data engine, right? Which is, you know, figure out where you're weak, ask the fleet for more data on inaccuracies, you know, filter that stuff and turn it into training data and tests, and then do it again through the whole cycle. Mm -hmm. Got it. On the other side, uh, yeah, that slide. So on the 1 million eight camera, 10 second video mm -hmm. clips. So is this, um, are they getting, you think, 1 million video clips per shadow mode round? Or is this the total no, this is, this was, of all seven so, rounds? So they have, the, they have a data set that they're using for training and testing and validation, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as you go through this process, uh, the, th the things that are useful in the beginning, aren't, you, they, don't, they aren't necessarily useful at the end. Right. You, so your data set evolves. Mostly you're adding things to the data set. Occasionally you will take things out of the data set. Right. But in general, your data set, your training data set just grows and grows and grows. Right. So when, by the time they had gone through their seven loops, 
the final form of that data set that they were using to train the version that they pushed out to the fleet. And that he said subsequently they ran it for three weeks and they had these statistics from it. The, the final data set that was used to train that version of the network that they finally pushed out to, I, I think about 20,000 odd cars, had a million eight second or a million captures where a, a single capture is all the video. And he just mentions the video, but it'll also include like the GPS, you know, the accelerometers for the IMU, radar return signals, maybe what the sonar was doing. It'll include everything the car was doing, but they'll have a capture. The overwhelming majority of the capture will, of course, be the camera video feeds, right? Because that's much, much larger than all the other data is combined. But so that that data, those captures included, each capture included 10 seconds of data from all eight of the cameras in the car, Got right? It. So that's what the one, one million is. So at the end, they had a million pieces of data to train on that were important and relevant, right? Mm -hmm. So presumably 500,000 wouldn't have been enough, right? Mm -hmm. Or 300,000 wouldn't have been enough to get the quality. You needed to have a million samples. And remember this is, I mean, a million obviously satisfies the large criteria. It, it's clean, uh, I mean, presuming it's clean because people went through all of these million clips to make sure that they were good. And the diversity is the real trick, right? These aren't a million more or less the same thing. These are a million highly variant examples of things that happened in the world that they decided were valuable for training. So that is an insanely difficult data set to assemble for anybody except Tesla. Like nobody can do this except Tesla, Assu you know, assemble a million eight camera, 10 second clips, which are, specially selected, carefully selected to be highly diverse in the in the distribution of things that they show you about the world. So included in that, they mm -hmm. have 16 billion object right. labels. Okay, hold on. Um, with this mm -hmm. 1 million clips, so is this the entire data set, like in terms of driving footage that Tesla is training their neural nets on? I mean, is this, or is this more for the specific, let's say application or to add certain features? Um, which is this is just it? for the AE? Exactly. Is or, is this the, is this, or is this, yeah, the, or is this the entire basically video library that the, the entire neural nets are trained off of? It, I would, I would say that neither one of those is actually the right characterization of this. Mm -hmm. So, so Tesla is in the process of making a transition away from, they used to, to have a still frame based training stuff. They didn't take video for a long time, right? Up until two years ago or something, they weren't taking video from the field. They weren't doing 4D training, right? They were taking individual snapshots and they were training the individual cameras to be better at detecting objects. Now, that data that they took before, it's not useless to them today. They probably still have it and they probably still use it for some of the functions, right? But its importance has diminished relative to the new stuff that they're getting. So uh, these, the way that Carpathy presented these numbers on this slide was this was the data that they gathered in the process of developing this AEB feature. But at the, the, at the final process, the AEB feature is a feature of the whole network, right? It's not, it's not like a standalone thing that's separate, which is developed and is, which is tested separate. It's a capability of the overall system. So the full network is being trained on this. This is part of the network of the data set, which is being used to train all this. Now, they might have had a, a bunch of other video clips that were also very important, um, which, are, which improve the diversity and whatnot before this. So it's hard to know how much of the video data set that they're training from right now is represented by this sample. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a substantial chunk of it. Mm -hmm. This probably isn't all of it, but it's probably a it's probably a decent sized chunk of it. Like, I don't think that they have a billion <laughs> clips, right? Mm. I, maybe they have 10 million. I'd, yeah. I'd guess they have five or something like that. He wasn't really clear about that uh, kind of yeah. thing, but this is not easy stuff to gather. He described this as a four month process of iterating through the shadow loop seven times and gathering this the, the, the iterative data that they needed to refine it. So they gathered a, a million clips, a million captures in, uh, over a four month period while they were developing this, this feature. But, but this data is used for training the whole network. It's not sure. just used for training AEB. Sure. Um, yeah. Interesting stuff. So can you go over this, uh, 6 billion object label? So my understanding is we're talking about the 1 million, uh, video clips here. Um, mm. 
you know, all of the labels basically combined of objects is basically 6 billion, right, with that. I right. mean, um, and then we're talking about accurate depth and velocity. So we're talking about each of the objects that are in the video clips Tesla has. I guess I want to talk about this in our next episode, which is auto labeling, mm -hmm. how, you know, Tesla actually auto labeled um, the depth and velocity. But um, in terms of just this discussion here, we're talking about each of these video clips has all of the objects that I guess they can identify labeled with their depth and velocity, right? Um, yes. Of all the objects. It's, this statement is a little obscure because mm -hmm. it's not clear if these were the 6 billion objects that they labeled specifically for the AEB functionality, or if this includes, because there's a ton of non AEB related, mm -hmm. you know, objects that also get detected. Um, so it's yeah. not clear in this, uh, from this number, my guess is that this, that he's specifically talking about the AEB, you know, let's remove the radar and still have AEB work you know, project in particular that they ended up labeling 6 billion, uh, it's because, mm -hmm. uh, depth and velocity are especially important in AEB, right? It's, it's much more likely to be a critical thing that you need to make a quick decision about an emergency situation than it is for, you know, like fire hydrants and recognizing stop signs. And, you know, I mean, there's zillions of other things that they do where, um, depth and velocity are much less important. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious, um, yeah, with this um, depth and velocity label. So this is, is this something that Tesla, let's say four months ago, they didn't have in their data sets, like the depth and velocity of all their objects, or was it just limited in, in kind of scope back then? So they definitely were doing depth and velocity labeling uh, because it was an output of the camera networks. Right. Even the camera networks before that didn't have radar going into them would provide depth and velocity estimates for objects like other cars, for instance, in the field of view of the cameras. So that was more than four months ago, <laughs> like that was two years ago or 18 months ago or whatnot. We saw that in the cars. So uh, so that was there. Um, my guess is that this six billion objects is in the course of this particular effort that they labeled six billion objects. Okay. So Carpathy, when he was describing data capturing for this stuff, he did mention that, that they were using the radar in the cars in the fleet to help label the data that they were getting from the cameras. So it might be that they had a particular, that they had a special data gathering effort with these 221 mm -hmm. triggers. Got it. Uh, and they had a special labeling effort that was designed to particularly focus on the accuracy of depth and velocity. Yeah, because I mean, you're, you're saying before the cameras had a depth and velocity, you know, field right. there, but I'm guessing it wasn't that accurate, right? Like say a couple of years ago versus... Well, so yeah. the way that we can kind of tell that it wasn't that accurate is you could look at the cameras that were that were looking forward and that were augmented with radar. And you could look at, like, for instance, what the b camera was saying about cars that it got and the jitter on the velocities and positions for, like, the cameras that didn't have radar. But only the forward cameras have some radar overlapping with their field of view. Like, in fact, the wide, the wide camera. So there's a narrow a main and a wide camera in terms of the field of view. There's three of them uh, behind the rear view mirror in the front of the car, right? And the narrow and the main, they both overlap with the radar, but wide, like half of it is stuff. And so you could you could actually see, like if you looked at the uh, at some of Barry Green's like labeled videos, you can see a vehicle, you know, transition as you're dr say driving past a car in an adjacent lane. You could see how consistent the velocity and position were right up until the point where it exited the field of view of the radar, right? And then the numbers with the numbers and start jittering around. So they were definitely doing it. It just wasn't great, right? Mm. And I mean, and they were, it you know, could, and we, this is an example yeah. of how they were relying on radar at the time exactly. to supply what the. And Carpathy went. He was at some pains a couple of times to mention right, essentially, that the bar for how good the vision system had to be wasn't that high because they had radar. They had this crutch and they were relying on the crutch. They had it. They were going to use it. Vision was focusing on other things. And that when they took the crutch away and they made the vision networks get good, the vision networks got good. Got it. Um, let's go back to this one slide, the final data set. So we have seven rounds of shadow mode, um, 1 million of these video clips, um, 
plus other info, and then six billion object labels, and then lastly, 1.5 petabytes. Is that, what is that? Is that 1,500 terabytes? That's uh, 512 kilobytes per frame for those 1 million uh, things. So basically, it's a lossless video compression algorithm run on the 10 million. That, oh, that's what most of it is. Got it, okay. On the 1 million clips. Got it. Um, yeah, I mean, um, what, what do you make, I mean, if we were to zoom out a bit, um, I mean, you mentioned how, you know, the big challenge is this diversity, you know, of, of yeah. scenarios, the edge cases. Not, not just diversity, but the right diversity you uh -huh. want, right? Yeah. That, that's the trick. It's not just variability. Right? Yeah. It's the right variability, the so, stuff that adds value. Because I, uh -huh. everything that doesn't add value is just wasting your time, right? Sure, it, yeah. It takes, it takes training. It takes memory. It takes storage. Human beings have to look at it, and it's not adding value. So yeah. you just want the stuff that helps. Yeah. I mean, actually, to your point of, like, I was actually thinking yesterday, like, if – a competitor actually, let's say, had video recording of, like, let's say, you know, a video recording device, and then they recorded all this video and tried to upload it to, to gather this data on driving, let's say. In some ways, I, that would be a disadvantage in some ways, because you would have all this da worthless data, you know, that just isn't useful, that you have to it's, upload it's, I mean, and process and... Um, like it's in a way you think that it's yeah. productive, but it could be counterproductive in a sense. It's just yeah. too much stuff, you know, it's it's, just what's the value add of the exactly. incremental piece of data that, yeah. you, that you, because you can keep the value add high if you're very mm -hmm. selective about the data. And over time you have to become more and more and more selective because it's harder and harder to find the cases that you don't have in your data. The bigger your data set gets, the harder it is to find things that aren't already in there. And so the more effort you have to yeah. devote to, to that part of the function. Exactly. In the beginning yeah. where you don't know anything, yeah, you can just take a video camera and go, and you know, there are lots of demo projects that people, college students do this, you know, they, mm -hmm. they, they put an iPhone on the front of a car and then you drive it around for an hour. And this is George Hotz did with his, yeah, his first yeah. version of the Kama AI car. He just stuck a video in and, you know, drove around, took some, uh, uh, took some video and then trained a neural network to like turn the steering wheel based on, mm -hmm. on where the, where the neural network thought the middle lane was. And it worked right. You know, mm -hmm. the first, I think, uh, I mean, the, f the first couple of experiments to do that, they would just take 70 hours of somebody driving on a freeway, right, around whatever. And I think now, that, you know, people can do it with like five hours of video or something. I mean, the technique has gotten pretty good, but it only gets you so far, exactly. right? It gets you a crude demo. It doesn't It doesn't yeah. get you a production system. Yeah. And then the other thing is like this data running on, sh I mean, gathered in shadow mode, like when you think about that zooming out a, in a bit, mm. um, like how important is it, you think, that this was actually, you know, data gathered on the exact weakness, right, of that version of the neural nets, right, in real world situations. Um, like when I, when I look at that, it's like, this is very, it seems like it's very highly, you know, detailed, tailored information that Tesla's yeah. gathering, um, not just like generalized information, but it's like actionable stuff. Um, yeah. I'm just thinking like well, the thing I was saying yeah. about it's not enough to just have you want to specifically find the stuff that helps you mm -hmm. the the, th the thing that goes right to the to the crux of a problem that you're having that needs to get better about the system and shadow mode is a super important way of getting of course you know, you can always have a human being sit down and carefully analyze the failure mode and figure out what's going on and come up with a theory right and then decide well if we had this kind of thing it would it would be helpful, right? You have a human analyze it, form a theory, and and uh, and do something, and then and but the if you don't have shadow mode, right? What the human has to ask the system for is, oh, we just need more tunnels, you know, or you you need you need very general criteria that you can describe because you don't have a dummy version of the system that you're trying to test running in the car, right? The thing that shadow mode gives you is it lets you put it lets you put an a uh, an operating, uh, but not piece of code in the car that's not controlling the car. It's just running there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you can put it in the real world and you can have triggers that look at its behavior. So it, so the behavior of the thing you're trying to improve, it itself can become part of the trigger that lets you pick stuff. And there are all mm -hmm. kinds of triggers that you exactly. can write if you had that, if you have that, that you can't write if you don't have it. So what it does is it'll, it lets the system be a lot more effective at 
uh, in, in particular ways. I mean, there are lots of triggers you can write, even if you don't have the shadow mode code yeah. running in there. But shadow mode is definitely a really useful tool. And you can see that, you know, when, when Carpathy describes this whole process, he describes it as going through seven loops of shadow mode. You know, he, yeah. to, in his, the way he's talking about this, and I think probably the way he's thinking about it, is that, is that the important triggers, the really important triggers that they were pushing out and the really important data that they, that they were getting, it was specifically being triggered on observations of the shadow mode code. It wasn't just like every time I go in a tunnel, give me this number, right? Yeah. It was, you know, when I enter a tunnel and I see this behavior on from the shadow mode box, exactly. you know, which gives me an inclination that this is a tunnel entrance, which is problematic. Give me that one because yeah. it's possible that only one percent of tunnel entrances are problematic. So you don't want to put 100 in, you know, exactly. 99 of those aren't useful. You just want the one that's actually a problem. Mm -hmm. And the only way you really know it's a problem is if you have the shadow mode code running in the car. Yeah. I mean, I, I like that. Or it's interesting you point out that, yeah, the behavior of the shadow mode itself becomes it seems like part of the trigger um yeah. that gives it this additional kind of specific value right where they could you know really well like use the that. bounding box jitter yeah. like you've got your pseudo radar code and you want and you're looking for situations where where it does or it doesn't you know where sometimes it's detecting well and sometimes it doesn't so what are your two choices if you don't have shadow mode you have an engineer look at all these recordings that you have and he, and he looks at situations where you know you've got a lot of jitter and he tries to guess oh it's because of the tree or oh it's because of the color of the sidewalk or whatever the deal is right and then he writes all these triggers and he pushes them out to the car which are trees and sidewalks and whatnot right but if he's got the shadow mode code he's got a much simpler job he's just like if i have jitter do a capture <laughs> right it's very simple mm -hmm. and it captures what you want very specifically mm -hmm. yeah interesting i mean if you okay so i want to go to this is kind of going to the weeds here but let's say you know there's a jitter uh box and uh you capture that uh, the system gets it and then oh man this is going into our, our next video a little bit but um, <laughs> if we you can just you know, we yeah, can table it yeah and... yeah but actually this data collection auto labeling is like it seems like so related but let's say you take that video clip and um, um, part of the jittering, let's say, let's say it's because I say there was a, a split second or something where it didn't have the right data. But if you look at the entire data clip, you're able to label that object throughout the entire video clip without the jitter. And if you feed that back into the neural net system, does that get rid of the jitter? Like if you have enough of those type of clips, uh, Many times it will. Okay. Maybe most of the time it will. Like, you know, the temporary occlusion, we were talking about the mm -hmm. clouded dust that occludes the car, right? So that was one of the examples Carpathy had in his talk where, you know, he was he was talking about how auto labeling is an off offline thing that they do. And I think this is the thing that that um, that Elon was describing as training from video or whatnot, like a couple of years ago, which is they take these clips, they you know, they they take all these clips. And they put them into an, this offline auto labeling program that runs on that giant supercomputer that they're building. Like that's the most important thing that supercomputer does right now. It takes these video clips and it figures out the whole three dimensional situ scene that the car is driving through by integrating all of the frames from all of those cameras with all their overlapping fields of view. So they're able to build a 3D model of the scene that the car was going through, including the other cars, the fire hydrants, the pedestrians, and all that kind of stuff. So they can go back and forth on that until it makes sense. They can they know what the future is, mm -hmm. and they know what the past is at every single point along, so they can stitch it. So in the case of that occlusion where you're driving along, mm -hmm. and there's a cloud, and you temporarily can't see the car, mm -hmm. because you have the whole 10 second clip, you know a moment later where the car was after the occlusion cleared. And so you can interpolate in between the two places you saw it re really clearly and know what its position must have been in the other things. So even in those frames where you could only barely see it because the occlusion was there, you can still reliably label it because you're, mm -hmm. because this offline auto labeling system that you've got will produce really high quality labels for all the objects in all the frames, exactly. even if you have temporary occlusions. Yeah. I mean, it seems like, um, that like, um, I mean, I'm curious about this too. So back, how long ago do you think Tesla was just using more images as the main kind of data set? Because it seems like if you use video and you, you know, label objects across time 
you know, then you get this element of predictability, like you're able to predict certain things when even objects aren't even there based upon, you know, the, let's say, the trajectory of how, you know, things work out. But if you don't, if you don't have video clips, and you're not labeling across time, then you just have, let's say, static images or something, then you don't have that ability, like, it seems like you'll get a lot more uh, unpredictability. You're just, you know, focus on the present moment. Like, have you seen are, that? Are you shift? asking like, why didn't they start with video? Oh or? yeah, no, I, I guess I know. I, I mean, it's obvious in the sense that it takes a lot more, you know, um, yeah. uh, data, compute you need a really power. Big computer. Yeah, you need a <laughs> lot of stuff. It's harder to collect, you know, um, yeah. these video clips as well. But like, up until what point do you think? Was it just a gra gradual shift? Do you think? Um, it was a couple of years ago. I, okay. Well, no, I mean, you know, you can imagine it. Mm -hmm. If you'd asked anybody, you know, even five years ago, like if you had infinite computation, what would you do? Well, I'd train from video. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's obvious that that's going to be a win. But from a resource standpoint, you know, they probably just couldn't do it. I'm sure they were thinking about it for years before they did it and and looking at, well, if we did do it, how would we do it and what would we need and doing experiments to figure out, well, like, what's the right way to do it? You know, what's the economical way to do it? How can we start? Where do we want to end up? You know, come up with a plan for that whole thing. And then you lay out your thing. Well, here's cluster one. <laughs> you know, they're on cluster three now. So, you know, here's the first cluster and we needed it to do this and we needed it to do that. And we were going to capture this kind of data and we we're going to train it this way. And through that process, they gradually figure out, they learn more about, you know, why do they collect 10 second clips, right? I mean, it's a nice round number, right? But would five be enough? How about, do you need 20? You know, what's the right number? You can imagine that they did experiments figuring that kind of stuff out. All right. Um, man, I have so many questions on this. Uh, <laughs> what I want to do here is actually I have um, uh, some, I want to talk about this, this idea in, we'll do another video right after this. Um, it'll be kind of a, another side topic, but on the advantage of the Tesla fleet, like like what exactly you know does that do with data? Um, but let's talk about that, um, and then we'll head our episode after that will be um, on auto labeling and kind of what that means in the bigger picture. Um, and we've got a couple of episodes after that regarding the supercomputer training, et cetera. So. <laughs> We're going to be our whole day. <laughs> or we have to split it on a, a couple of days. But anyways, okay. um, yeah, we'll be back soon with our next episode. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>